Next up, we've got a local, Andy Dykes. And okay, as you probably gathered from my little outburst there, I care about accessibility. Um, so does Andy. Although, so actually, uh, clarifying point. For a long time, I talked about accessibility and inclusive design as kind of synonyms, but I've come to think of them differently. Accessibility is kind of the outputs. Um, what you produce that can kind of be measured, how accessible is this? Whereas inclusive design is about the process, how you get to having something accessible. And I've also come to believe that maybe the inclusive design part is as important, if not more important, than, than those outputs. Well, Andy has a story to tell us uh, about an inclusive design journey. Uh, he's the, a design principal at Tesco Bank, and he's going to tell us about you know, the toolkit and framework they came up with and their inclusive design journey. Uh, his talk is called Inclusive by Default, Creating Experiences for Everyone. From Edinburgh, please welcome Andy Dykes. So I'm going to kind of pick on this quickly, actually, because there was a bit of a typo when I submitted this. You can see it's a question. I'm not actually trying to be that provocative <laughs> about whether we should create these things or not. Um, yeah, but it, it, like, probably if you indulge me for a second as well, um, when submitting slides, um, when I was doing this, there was one thing that kind of stood out to me, and I'm going to kind of ask you to show hands, actually. If you're looking at your pack and you're presenting, what thing would annoy you the most? Is it a typo or is it something that's misaligned and when you're moving through slides, it moves around? So the typo? Or the misalignment. Yeah. I'm in the right place. <laughs> yeah, so, so, yeah, as I said, uh, I'm Andy Dykes. I'm a design principal at Tesco Bank. Uh, I've been in the design industry for over 15 years. And you tend to find at a certain point, tenure means nothing, does it? Um, but I've been in financial services that whole time as a designer because to that kind of discussion, I think being in amongst the teams and having a stake in what you're doing is really important. And along that journey, I've been lucky enough to work with a lot of talented designers. And one of the values that I've picked up from them along that way has been to be inclusive and think about particularly accessibility, but inclusion as well. So I'm going to share a bit of a case study on the journey that we've been on uh, to try and be inclusive, particularly over the last year. Um, and it, it actually starts as one of the motivations for this. It was early last year. And I mean, you're probably a little bit familiar with Tesco and some of the values. Um, but we'd, we'd changed actually the, the headline purpose statement to start including the thought of communities and planet a little better every day. Because this has always been something that's been important to Tesco in the background, but not something necessarily that's been in the foreground of the purpose. And I was at, uh, so we've got internal networks and there's one called Enabled, which is around accessibility for colleagues and how we talk about how we support them. Um, and our chief customer officer, Sega, uh, was the sponsor of this meeting. So I'm, I'm there and we're actually getting into quite a discussion about this statement and what's it, what does it mean? And she posed the challenge of us in that meeting about, well, you know, it's great for colleagues, but what more can we do for customers? So I'm seizing on this opportunity here. And um, this means, you know, I'm already thinking we've got support up the top to do something. So what can we do? So I kind of I take that challenge away and I'm starting to think about all the, the positive things that we're doing. That's where I'm starting from. You know, we do a lot already. You know, we've done user testing with people with disabilities. We've just done... Um, like a, a nice piece of work looking at, you know, the moment when you've got to authenticate payments and it really sucks, doesn't it? Um, we've just done a, a big piece of work with, with that team. Um, it was 20 participants with a range of, you know, different disabilities that they're living with to kind of point out the key factors for the success of that project went down really well. You know, so we're doing things like that. You know, we've done a study where we're looking at the accessibility of forms and uh, as part of that, I was, you know, I was down, it was actually just in Edinburgh. We'd spent time with someone in their late fifties with MS in a wheelchair. And the only way that they can interact with the world and talking, you know, was this little joystick. 
and we were looking at the setup you know, that he had, and he kind of described how online banking was his last piece of freedom where he can pay his carer. That's the, the only task really that he can now do for himself and it's so important to him. And as you see him kind of set up, he's got this big, it's this huge wheelchair that he's actually in. He's got a monitor probably no bigger than this one in front of him. But the practicalities are, he can't get closer to that thing. It's like a meter and a half away. So media are starting to think about, you know, the importance of font size for him. So, you know, all this good work is happening and we're also doing vulnerable customer audits, accessibility audits. Um, but then you start to realize as you dig into it a little bit, it's inconsistent. So yes, we do accessibility audits, but they only happen in the teams where, you know, some of us who are passionate about this are. In other projects, it's not happening because people don't realize that they need to do it. You know, we're doing vulnerable customer audits, so this is where we're trying to see where people might be susceptible to harm. But we've based it on a Capital One toolkit, which is really good, by the way, you should look it up. Um, but that's based off their customer base and their problems, not ours. Um, and then you kind of, you, you talk around the organization, and I'm sure you probably hear a bit of this in yours as well. You know, you hear the myths and misunderstandings. You know, it's like, oh, well, that's like 5% of people, or, you know, there's only 4% of our customers have registered as vulnerable, so we don't need to think about that right now. But we know that's not true. So, I mean, I think the positive thing behind that was certainly, like, as, as you speak to everybody, you know, colleagues all want to do the right thing, and their intentions are really good. It's just, they, they, it's awareness, or they don't know what to do. So that's one of the first drivers for the piece of work that's important. The second one is this, it's consumer duty. So, in, you know, for the broader audience, like in the UK, uh, the FCA, the Financial Conduct Authority, basically tells financial services and institutions, like, you must do this and, you know, protect consumers and what they do. And they've been on a bit of a journey recently where they've been asking financial services to actually focus on vulnerable customers and think about what they're doing for them. Um, to some success, but now actually they're supercharging that, I would argue, with consumer duty, which is due to come in in July 23, where there's now like an obligation for financial services. It's not just gone from ensuring fair outcomes for this general person, it is now actually about protecting your customers from foreseeable harm and understanding the needs of those customers so you've designed your products and services around them. I mean, it's, it's like a goldmine for us as designers. This is, you know, um, and actually in the document, which is big, but if, you know, if you've got the time, it's worth reading, um, they identify inclusive design as a means to prevent, you know, uh, foreseeable harm. And as part of this, you know, they, they identify four drivers of vulnerability. And I suppose if anyone's familiar with behavioral psychology, and if you think about the Cone B model, these are actually quite similar to you know, behavioral barriers as well for behavior. But they've got four drivers of vulnerability they've identified. So the first is health. So, you know, if you're not in good health, you know, there's a lot of problems that you might start to experience. Um, you know, you might have some kind of condition that you're living with, you might have broken your arm. Um, that can be a, a real driver of vulnerability. Life events as well. So if you've suffered a bereavement, you know, like your, your emotional state's gonna be very different or um, you're suffering a family you know, breakup in some form. There's also resilience. So this is um, people's ability to respond to things around them. So that might be emotional resilience or financial resilience. You know, if something happens, how equipped are they to respond to that? And then there's capability. So in capability, you know, that's, well, I mean, practically how much money do you have? Like really influences your ability to respond to, to financial events, but also in capability, it's about understanding, it's about, you know, comprehension, what experience have you had um, and, and literacy. And just to give you, oh, I love this Venn diagram actually, um, but just to give you a, you know, a sense of the scale of this as well, you know, like when you hear those myths about 5%, um, 
In 2020, the FCE did a, a big survey looking at financial lives and actually they identified in the UK at that moment in October that 53% of UK adults displayed one or more characteristics of vulnerability. Um, and you might be thinking, well, obviously pandemic, but when you actually look at what they did for their survey in 2019, it was slightly higher in 2019 than it was in 2020. And they, they do estimate that actually as, it, as the pandemic moved on, this they estimated was more like 70% of people. The other thing that's a good reflection point on this is to start thinking about the intersectionality of these things. You know, so I might have a health condition, but then I also experience a life event. And then, you know, so these things compound and people aren't always aware of these vulnerabilities as that happens to them as well. So that's the second driver. <coughs> so armed with that, you know, like pitch the case and we get approval to go and like run a program of work. We tend to call it a design runway. So this is where we've got a big gnarly problem and we're going to spend, you know, but 10 weeks or so get right into the problem and coming up with some solutions for that. And myself and one of the designers, Scott, that were working on this, we've been reading the book by Kat Holmes, uh, Mismatch. And if you've read it or not read it, brilliant book, go and pick it up. Um, oh, that's misaligned, oh my God. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but in that, like she's got this beautiful little exploration of what it means when we talk about inclusion. And actually it's a good starting point for us to be you know, reflecting on this and thinking about what that means for us. And she, she actually kind of draws it out as, well, if you're thinking about inclusion, it, it means that you're also excluding people. So that circle then represents a barrier that people need to kind of work around them um, to experience your service. But she uses kids play as the example in her book, but thinking about in a financial context, what are the barriers for us? And thinking about something as big as Tesco as well, you know, because we kind of jokingly internally kind of go about our target market and it's, you know, anyone that shops at Tesco and it's like, oh geez, well that's like 90% of the UK um, is in at some point. But for us, like there's, you know, there's things here that will keep people out because practically we're a bank. So your credit score potentially, you know, that's one thing, but that's okay because under the, you know, the new regulation, that's our, our target audience. But one thing that we're now immediately aware of for us is that we need to ensure that people when they're in our circle are protected from foreseeable harm. And that's something that we need to think about clearly. The other thing, and this is where you start to get the crossover between accessibility and inclusion, actually, is thinking about to get into that circle, we don't want to create unintended barriers. So we need to think about the barriers that are preventing people coming in and removing those. But we also need to think about the barriers that might be in our service that are pushing people out as well. You know, can they access the app? Can't, you know, can they, can they read this? Can they access it? You know, if I've got this calculator, can I can understand the way that you've made all the small decimal points smaller and how confusing that is. And I think I'm not going to come to the definition. This is more of a reflection point because it's, it's a good one to stop and think about what does inclusion mean in your context? So this led us to setting a vision for the piece of work because obviously we've got to set some scope and we've got to kind of set down what we're going to try and achieve in this piece of work. <clears throat> and we're describing it as inclusive by default. You know, it, it shouldn't be an afterthought. It shouldn't be something that we do at the end of the project or if some one person is involved, it needs to be there all the time. And we need to create products and services and communications that meet the needs of every Tesco bank customer. And as part of that, um, we identified three groups that we really need to actually make sure we understand to be inclusive. Um, so it's people with accessibility needs. It's understanding that. It's understanding what it means to be vulnerable as well. And it's also thinking about, you know, minority groups or different ethnic or cultural backgrounds and beliefs that might create barriers. You know, for example, in some of the research we've done, we'd heard about people really getting worried and anxious if they've got a really long surname that's hard to pronounce and the anxiety that they have with that and might start to use a different surname <coughs> 
but that then has an odd interaction when you get to a bank where you want to tell them you know, the absolute truth when you're applying for a product. Uh, just for context, because we knew this was quite a big piece of work actually for the third box, actually we've parked that in this first part of it and this year we're going after a very specific study in that space. Uh, we also then set a couple of outcomes. So this was so that we understood what we're going to deliver. So firstly, actually having colleagues being able to assess experiences for inclusion and accessibility would be a massive leap forward. If everyone in the organisation could just, you know, in that Toyota sense, like hit the button, like there's something wrong over here, that would take us a massive way forward. The second is to then actually have colleagues that are confident in being able to design inclusive experiences. And that's making sure that it's not just design, that it's everybody in the organisation who's got some role to play. And finally, I mean, this means nothing if we're not doing something for customers. So it's starting to look for the clues that we're making a difference for customers. So set with those outcomes, um, we actually partnered with Nile. So a big shout out to them as well. So we had Louise, Alexa and Robin from Nile supporting us on this project. Um, we put together a human centered design process, as you might expect. Um, and within this, kind of two parts to it. So the first thing we wanted to do, because we're not going to have impact if it, you know, we just focus on the customer, it's how actually our colleagues designing for these things. So the first thing that we did was actually we did a bit of cultural benchmarking with our own teams. So we went round everybody from you know, like the risk teams, financial, product owners, developers and engineers, the testing teams, <coughs> designers, the commercial teams, to understand their awareness and their needs. We then did a two week piece of customer discovery um, where we actually interviewed uh, 16 people kind of in the vulnerable space. So we had 10 that showed signs of vulnerability based off the characteristics from the FCA. And we had six um, with accessibility needs. Uh, one of the key challenges in this process though, as you, you could probably start to think about is we're not exactly gonna be interviewing people who are in the grips of an anxiety attack um, or have shut themselves off because of that anxiety. Uh, and, and that's a real challenge. So we had to really think about what, how do we understand those moments for people and what's driving it. So we actually spent a lot of time with industry experts to do that. So people who are dealing with and supporting people day in, day out um, with these things. So, you know, people like the Money Advice Trust, the Royal National Institute for the, the Deaf, Cope Scotland, and Step Change, so Cope Scotland help people uh, with mental health and Step Change, people who are in you know, financial crisis. So what did, what did we learn? I'm gonna give you just a, a quick run through of some of our kind of key research highlights here. I'm trying to figure out time. Um, so everybody's vulnerable. Everyone has the potential to be um, in a vulnerable position. And actually we need to start thinking like that. And what we heard a lot in our research was, you know, like people could be smiling. Um, it, it, and it's very difficult to understand what's actually going on. And that customers themselves, from the participants we spoke to, also struggle to identify that they're in a vulnerable position or don't want to share that they're in a vulnerable position. Everybody makes mistakes. And thinking particularly about the influence of feelings and people being in a hot or a cold state when they're applying. So you think maybe um, someone who's maybe got themselves into a hot state, so they're, quite, they're feeling quite manic, they're excited, they're feeling really positive, and then they apply for a car loan. And then the next day they go, oh, oh wait, I can't, I can't afford that car. How am I gonna do this? That, that, you know, that's a really difficult situation and how can we help? Um, so, you know, what happens when things go wrong and explaining and trying to understand, make sure that people understand cooling off periods and what support's available. Everybody's busy. So really understanding that, you know, people will try to do and manage their, their financial lives and tasks in those moments they've got in the evening where they're completely knackered from their day job. 
You know, we, we don't want to be adding to that pressure already, but you're also mentally exhausted. So your ability to understand some of these complex, you know, jargon and consequences of something that might take 10 years to pay off are really difficult. You know, so we need to really think about that. Also, everybody needs simplicity. Um, you know, thinking about all the jargon, particularly in banking, that people might be susceptible to. Like, we need to think about that. How do you break these concepts down in ways that can help people understand? And an important point here, this is not about taking a privileged position of educating people. We need to help them understand what's going on to give them the confidence to make uh, the right decisions. A good example in this one recently, we've been working on a project for top-up loans. So it, when I say top-up, it probably creates this particular mental model in your mind about how that process is going to work. And this is quite common if you look across some other financial providers, but you very quickly, when you get into it, realise that that's not how it works. You're not just topping up your loan. It's actually closing the old one and opening a new one at a bigger amount, which means your cooling off period for your first loan, if you decide you don't want it, is gone. So you're totally exposed for the borrowing from the first one. So it's thinking about the language that's there and the mental models that that's, that's then creating. It's also thinking that everyone communicates differently. So I'm going to speed up a wee bit, just in time. And everyone deserves to know what's happening. This one's really important. So if you think about like some of the anxiety that people can experience when things are happening, you know, um, we need to communicate really clearly about, you know, it's going to take five days for this to happen. You know, your money will be, you know, sent to you here and when. One key reflection for us through this process was definitely, um, you know, humans are very complicated. And if you think about the range and the intersectionality of things that people can be living with, it's even more complicated. But what we can actually do is, you know, think about, you know, how we design to prevent harm is more important than why customers are vulnerable. So we can put the focus on making sure that this is really legible, you know, like it's really readable. We've got the contrast levels right. You know, it's better because that'll help way more people than focusing on, well, this person can't read it because of this. They can't read it because of this. They can't do this. That's just not, and you're also starting to pigeonhole people as well in your thinking. So that's, I think that's a real key one. It's starting to make it much more actionable. Um, just to give you a kind of sense of like what we created for colleagues as well to help them. We created a, a toolkit which we made available internally um, with a set of principles to guide their intent. So this is at the start of a project, for example, where they can start to question, you know, what's going to be important. A set of standards to try and raise it above, you know, like accessibility standards are great, but they don't necessarily guarantee an accessible experience and they're quite a low bar. Um, so we set a, a series of standards that kind of went beyond that. We also created archetypes and personas. So the archetypes really cover a broad range of vulnerabilities and personas were actually very specifically to try to bring to life accessibility guidelines for people. Uh, so just to kind of touch on like some of the archetypes that we created um, and that these actually were designed to, to try and bring together multiple experiences that we heard from our research. You know, so we've got, I'll pick on a, a tentative approach in the middle. So this is someone who's got a lot of anxiety in their life. So they tend to be really cautious about what they're doing. They need to be well informed. They need to be able to reach out and speak to you if they've got a question you need to communicate really clearly to them as well because they will be sitting there worrying about what's going on if, if you're not. And they also don't like to be talked down to. Just because they're nervous and they're asking questions doesn't mean they don't know what's going on. And then we put together a series of accessibility uh, personas and this was really as well to try and build empathy with the teams for these situations because they can be so invisible. And I think the one that really stood out to me was thinking about June, for example, um, who is deaf. And one thing that I hadn't realised was that British Sign Language is, is not just a, like a, you know, a kind of side of English and it's been converted, it's its own language. And, you know, that was, that was a real big change and one that we're, we're actively working on. Uh, 
So just quickly, you know, obviously we've done a big piece of work here. We're trying to embed that in the organization. We've done some workshops. We've applied it to some projects. So what's going well? Uh, well, firstly, inclusive recruitment. I think that's the biggest thing that we've done that has worked really well. It's just opening up the scope of your recruitment. Don't have these, you know, this is a separate study. You know, now we do research every two weeks. As part of that, two people will be in there who have some kind of accessibility requirement, um, such as dyslexia. And we're learning so much from that. Uh, we had our first blind participant in that regular research last year as well. I mean, wow, we learned so much. Um, the archetypes have been really inspiring for colleagues with little support or guidance. So I think, you know, the way that you articulate these things makes it much more approachable and that's working really well, along with the videos that we created to try and build empathy. As a designer, I'm obviously focused on all the things that are not going well, though. So um, one thing that we're really conscious of is that we created a toolkit, but it's no good giving people tools if they don't know how to use them. So we're starting to focus on how do we create workshop formats, actually, to use those tools so they can be more effective. Um, inclusive practices need to be integrated into ways of working. And that's something that we're just trying to figure out as we move into safe agile at the moment. How do you integrate that into that process? And just don't underestimate the commitment that you're going to need to get this done. It's a, it's a huge shift and something that we are, despite all the wins, still wrestling with. So I get that, you know, for a lot of you, like probably getting budget to do a project like this will be quite difficult but how can you start your inclusive design journey from today? So I've got a, a quick top five. Um, firstly, don't try and do this by yourself. Like, in inclusive design is a team activity. Get everybody else involved. Accessibility guidelines don't guarantee accessibility. Remember that, you know, you need to test it with people. So inclus you know, inclusive recruitment in your usability testing and research is really important. Be mindful of, I could talk earlier because this is quite important, be mindful of your design tools and the fact that you do need to, you know, design for everybody. The design tools might not let you know you're designing an ex inclusive experience. And finally, on your mobile phone, you have loads of accessibility tools. Go and play with them. Go try your website on them and listen to them. Uh, they're brilliant. I'm a bit over, sorry. All right. <laughs> I don't have any time for uh, questions with Andy, but um, grab them later. Actually, quick question for you. Those principles and uh, standards, all that, are they publicly available? Uh, not at the moment, no. Change that.